Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. This week in Australia, we celebrated International Women's Day and the theme for International Women's Day this year was Break the Bias. So I thought it was time for us inside financial services to talk about something that hasn't really got a lot of airtime and that's financial abuse, specifically gender-based financial abuse. As you can imagine, this is a pretty heavy topic, but an important one, so please don't shy away from listening. I obviously need to issue a bit of a trigger warning because we are discussing specifically gender-based violence today and domestic violence in general. I am delighted, though, that I got to interview the highly respected Moo Bolch. She is a social justice and gender equality leader in Australia and has a career-long commitment to addressing and preventing violence against women and LGBTIQ plus people. She worked uh, with the Commonwealth Bank to help develop the ComBank's trauma-informed community wellbeing team and currently works as the Director of Primary Prevention at the Women and Girls Emergency Centre in Sydney. I think you'll agree today is a big but very important conversation and Moo helps us understand how we as financial services professionals can help. Well, hello and welcome, Moo. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolute pleasure, Jess. Lovely to be here. I want to say from the very beginning of today's conversation that this is a really big, complicated and heavy topic. And so I probably need to issue a trigger warning that we are today talking about things like domestic violence and gender-based violence. And so, of course, um, if this brings up anything for you, please make sure that you reach out to a professional. But it is an important conversation, especially off the back of uh, International Women's Day. I felt that it was really important to have a conversation that I feel isn't happening nearly enough in the financial sphere. And I want to focus on domestic violence specifically around financial abuse, gender-based financial abuse, and how we as the professional financial advice community of Australia can learn more, can understand more, can identify more, and of course, you know, see what we can do to help break this terrible cycle. There is no one better to talk about all of these complicated problems, I don't think, in Australia than you, Moo. So to give everyone a bit more of an understanding, would you mind sharing a little bit more about you? Mm, for sure. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I would say firstly, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm joining you from Gadigal land um, this morning and paying my respects to elders um, past and present and any um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander listeners that you have in your podcast. Um, I'm so excited to be talking about this. I, I have worked um, in all sorts of parts of the domestic and family violence um, and violence prevention sector for um, more than a couple of decades now. And um, I think the energy and the enthusiasm and the, the will in the community to um, start to shift some of the horrific statistics um, that we see and hear about almost daily um, it has never been stronger. So um, it's a really exciting time to be talking about um, financial abuse um, specifically. It's something that we haven't talked about in Australia up until probably um, five or six years ago. Uh, and yeah, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you. Yay. So can we learn more about specifically what you do now? And then I'd actually love to, uh, sometimes I feel like we live in a very privileged prism in financial advice, because frankly, the people that come to see us are the people that can afford financial advice. And that is a often a very small population of Australians. I'd love to learn more about what are you and your team seeing mm. every day in the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I'm very privileged also to have to wear a number of hats. So um, three days a week, I come to Women's and Girls Emergency Centre, which is based in Redfern. That's where our head office is. We have um, 
a number of refuges and um, transitional accommodation. So um, the accommodation that women uh, and kids go into um, after they've kind of left that crisis um, space. And we also do a whole range of other things at, at um, Women's and Girls or WAJIC, um, as we're known. So we do a lot of community engagement. My role here is Director of Primary Prevention. Um, and what that means in, you know, uh, layperson's language is really connecting to community, having conversations with people like you, Jess, talking to people in, uh, you know, the, um, the communities around inner city Sydney and inner west of Sydney, but also having conversations with um, corporates, small businesses, um, uh, any kind of community network. So we do a lot with local government as well. Um, and we talk about things like um, how we can all be better bystanders, how we can um, approach and have a conversation with somebody if we're concerned about them, um, mm -hmm. if we think something's going on in their relationship. So teaching some of those really um, simple skills um, to give people the confidence to be able to spot abuse because it's happening all around us in every um across every demographic in every single postcode um in australia so whilst you might be working um in your day-to-day -day, uh, as financial advisors with people in the kind of upper echelons of um you know financial um privilege we know that women um generally women and some men as well um are often you know they may have lots and lots of money on paper they may have um, you know, be living to all extents and purposes um, a beautiful lifestyle, but actually they might be living with absolutely no access to, um, you know, their joint bank accounts or their funds. They may be being um, financially abused in a whole range of ways. Um, and it's often much harder to talk about those sorts of coercive behaviours where somebody's being abused in um, quite subtle and hidden ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the conversation that we've only really just started to have in the last few years in Australia. I think that that is such an important point because we like to believe that domestic violence in Australia doesn't happen. Firstly, I think that there is sort of, if you, if you don't live in it day to day, you just assume that no one does. And yet all the stats tell us otherwise. And you do assume that people in a higher socioeconomic standard of living are not affected by it. But we know that that is simply not true. Correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, it's so timely that we're doing, um, we're recording this podcast um, today in late Feb because um, I was really privileged. One of one of my other hats is um, providing advice to the Commonwealth Bank on their uh, financial abuse um, responses and, and prevention. Um, and so yesterday morning, we had a beautiful launch um, of uh, a couple of things, actually, one of which is um, another podcast um, done by Future Women, which I'd really encourage people to, to check out. They're releasing an episode a week, and it's centered around the voices of victim survivors. So the voices that often you don't hear. Mm. Um, but also, um, we launched uh, a report by Deloitte. So this is the first time that anybody has tried to quantify the direct cost of financial abuse in Australia. Um, and what they did was they took a, um, a, a you know some slices of um, research and they have found that the direct cost of financial abuse in in um, 2020, so in a 12 month period, um, is a staggering 5.7 billion dollars um, in Australia, uh, with an estimated cost to the economy of 5.2 billion. Um, so uh, 600,000 people over 18 years um, old uh, in Australia last year was subjected to financial abuse, sorry, in 2020. Sorry, just to pause on that because I think we have to. Yeah, it's a, it's a big number, right? <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And I, I feel that that needs its own sort of pause and reflection. Mm. 600,000 people in the 12 months prior to that report sort of data being launched were suffering actively from financial abuse. Absolutely. Um, we've never had that kind of number before. We've never really been able to quantify it in that way. Part of the problem, I think, in our space is, um, you know, we have some we have some pretty shocking statistics. You know, we know uh, that one in um, four women will experience um, physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. We know that one in 13 men will experience some form of um, intimate partner violence as well. Um, you know, we've all heard the statistic of um, uh, a woman a week um, dying. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that stuff makes headlines now, Jess, you know, that's um, a, my reflection as somebody who's been around in this space for a while now is that those those sorts of numbers were not 
even available um, yeah. a decade ago. However, we have to be careful to think that behind all of those numbers, you know, behind every single one of those 600,000 people is an incredibly complex story, often of extreme power and control. And so the financial abuse is often a part of all sorts of other um, types of abuse that are going on. Often not physical abuse. You know, uh, many of these people will completely fly under the radar. There will be no, you know, calls to the police because there's no physical violence. There will be no, um, uh, you know, reaching out to a service like Wayjack um, for support mm. because, um, you know, many people don't reach out to those to those services and supports for a whole range of reasons. So. Um, there's a lot of hidden abuse going on, often that people don't even recognise is, is happening because of the context in which we're having this conversation. Then we can only assume that that 600,000 is the minimum number of people that have been affected by financial abuse in Australia. And the number could be, hopefully not, but it could be significantly worse. Uh, Mu, I listened to you speak on another podcast and you said something that made me stop in my tracks. And I want to just talk about, it's a two-part question, I think. What mm. my, my question once I tell you the quote is why? And then the second part is why do you think financial abuse as a category has been left out for so long? I'm very happy and delighted that we're starting to talk about it, but I'm keen for your expert mm. thoughts on why it hasn't been a, a conversation to now. But what you said when you were being interviewed is violence is at the heart of Australian culture. Mm. Well, that's a massive question. We could probably talk for hours about that. Um, I mean, I think when you when you consider where um, Australia has come from in a um, in the sense of um, as a modern country, um, certainly post colonial um, Australia or Australia since colonisation, um, it's been built on pretty um, pretty rough and extreme circumstances for lots and lots of people, um, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, mm -hmm. um, but also a whole range of other people um, in Australia and particularly women. You know, uh, I, I really firmly believe that we have a, a particular set of circumstances in Australia that um, support gender inequality and have done for a, for a very long time. So while we've seen advances um, in other countries and a, um, a real challenging of um, some of the conditions that sit around gender inequality, um, I think we've got a way to go here in Australia. Having said that, um, we've also got some really smart people working on it here, um, which is exciting. And so uh, things like Our Watch, which is the National um, Prevention Foundation, have um, have sprung up in the last, um, you know, five or ten years. We have a national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, which is ending this year. And there's, there are um, negotiations and there's a draft actually that um, the Commonwealth is um, closing comments on today in terms of setting the direction for the next ten years. And financial abuse um, is um, is named in that. You know, it wasn't a thing that existed as a concept in the in the plan, in the current plan that's been running for the last 12 years. So we've got some systems and structures to start challenging uh, some of the really, you know, the underlying things that allow this inequality for um, for women to exist and be supported. Sure. And and why do you think financial abuse has for so long not been part of the narrative when we talk about domestic violence or gender based violence in Australia? A couple of reasons, I think. I think partly because um, for so long, domestic violence was just the business of women's services, so women's frontline, you know, feminist services, um, mm. refuges, those sorts of things, and nobody wanted to listen um, to, um, to what was going on, um, partly because it was considered a private hidden family matter, um, and that has shifted um, significantly. And the media, I think, in Australia has played a really big part in that. Um, victim survivor advocates have also played a massive part in that as well. And it's been actually a really beautiful partnership of um, journalists, usually female journalists, saying, actually, we're going to tell this story differently. And we're going to recognise that, um, you know, when another um, when another child is killed by um, their father as a revenge act to try and get back at um, mum or when um, a woman is killed by her ex-partner, it's not just a one-off incident. It's not just a thing that happens and mm. that's terrible. It's actually part of a much bigger social and cultural problem. And we have in Australia um, a whole lot of attitudes that are widely held in the community that, um, that support or excuse violence. The stats in Australia today are something like 80% of financial advisors are men. 
I think the average age of a financial advisor is 55 to 58. And I don't have the stats, but I'm going to make this up. I would say between 80 to 90% of financial advisors in Australia today are probably white, heteronormative, cisgendered men. And so this is a whole new big conversation that they may not have ever, ever had to think about having before. But I, I think it's important to say that you've had clients you, if you've been giving advice for a long time, you have had clients that have been the victim of domestic violence. You have or have had clients more than likely that have been a, um, a victim of financial violence. Can we talk about red flags? Mm -hmm. Can we talk about things that we should be looking for and what to do if we suspect mm -hmm. there is uh, domestic violence of any kind in a client base or a, cl a client couple that we have? Yeah. I mean, and I guess um, some of the things we're going to talk about now also apply to your broader life, right? Because we know this is not just happening in people's yeah. workplaces and um, with clients. We also know it's happening to people's siblings, to people's parents, you know. Um, now that we've kind of blown the lid on um, the the size of this problem um, and we've started talking about it in a much more sophisticated and, and nuanced way, we now know that um, actually – it's everybody's business to try and resolve this. So it's no longer just the business of women's services and the police, um, which was the way it was for a really long time. Mm, um, sure. So some of the things that are probably um, that may be red flags, some of the things that you may see or witness would be um, if a person feels really, if, if they look as if they're quite isolated, um, they may be cut off from um, friends and family. And that might be a long, slow process, um, which is really quite deliberate. So isolating somebody from their support networks, um, sometimes from, you know, their um, religious or cultural um, connections that might be preventing them from going to church or going to the mosque. It might be um, stopping them from participating in things like Mardi Gras um, for some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you see somebody who appears to be walking on eggshells, so there's, there's that fear, you know, um, coercive control is all about um, creating and then maintaining a level of fear um, and so it might not ever be fear of, you know, physical violence. And this is one of the things that I think we need to, you know, keep chipping away at that the, the myth that domestic violence um, results in um, physical injuries and broken bones. Um, for many, many um, victim survivors of violence, you know, they say there was never any actual physical violence. It was the threat of, it was the threat to, um, you know, take me to the family court and take away my children. It was those sorts of things that, um, that I knew that he would pursue to, you know, as as far as he could because um, he didn't want to lose um, that grip of power and control that he had over me. It might be um, that she's not allowed to do things or um, so it might be that she's not allowed to participate in the workforce or study mm. um, to be able to have those kind of connections to the outside um, and also to be able to have financial independence as well, particularly where you have clients who might be, you know, pretty lucrative on paper. Um, you know, there might be six or seven cars in the driveway, um, you know, multiple bedrooms in their in their house. They may have lovely country properties. But um, if she's not allowed to make decisions um, about uh, the joint fi finances, if she's being potentially coerced into, um, you know, taking out loans or signing up for things which she has no control over or no knowledge about um, what those impacts might be. That's certainly a sign of, um, of financial abuse. She might also look a bit um, overly anxious to please as well. Um, and so I think uh, there's a real structural piece in here around, um, you know, women traditionally have not had access to the same type of information and education around um, financial things. And I, you know, I count myself as one of those people. Um, I'm, I don't think I'm particularly fin financially literate, but um, I've understood a lot more kind of um, ha having worked in this space, um, you know, particularly with the last few years with banks, because I think there is some there is some structural stuff. There's some extra care that we can take with people, with clients where um, I mean, you know, whether when you're talking to a client, whether they kind of get what you're talking about or not. So making sure that they are walking into those joint decisions, um, really understanding what the implications might be, um, you know, down the track if, if things do go wrong. 
And then I guess um, in terms of knowing uh, what to do next, so um, somebody may disclose to you or they may not disclose to you. Um, if someone does disclose to you, you may be the first person that they've ever had that conversation with. So just making sure that you're really careful around that. Um, and there can be a whole range of reasons why they haven't disclosed to um, you know somebody they know. Um, it might be the only time that they've actually been in a um, in a space one on one with another person. They may not be allowed to go out and do um, other things. So um, just really actively listening, um, telling, being as non judgmental as you um, as you can, reassuring them that um, you will try and find them some help and support. You know, respecting their decisions because we know um, that for many victim survivors of violence, it takes a really long time to leave, and there are lots of complexities around why that happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, so not judging when somebody says, um, "I'm going back to that relationship again." Just understanding that there may be some really complex um, safety reasons around why um, that is, why she's um, why she's going back to that. You know, often quite horrific abuse, and that can be really hard if it's a friend or a family mem member. So, if it's somebody that you care about a lot, um, you know, letting them make the choices and really lead what that looks like um, for them is is a tough one. And and finally, also um, just taking care of yourself a bit as well. So, if you are a support person, either in a um, in a client um, relationship, or if you're a support person, um, in that more personal sense, just making sure that you have things around you that, um, a maintain your safety and also your mental health and wellbeing, because it can be really hard to hear about some of this stuff, um, whether you're, you know, personally connected to that, um, that individual or not. When I was doing research on financial abuse, because one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about this was I don't know a lot about financial abuse in Australia. And I'm shockingly embarrassed mm. to say that as someone who cares deeply about financial advice and financial literacy for Australians, particularly women and identifying as a female, I wanted to learn more, which is why I wanted to have this conversation today. So when I, when I looked into mm. it, one of the things that came out immediately as sort of a red flag, if you like, around financial abuse was that the financial abuser will, and I'm using inverted commas here, take care of the mm -hmm. finances. And that just resonated so deeply yep. with me because yep. for so many of us who are financial advisors, there are so mm -hmm. many situations where one person will be the dominant sort of relationship contact or decision maker. And it just mm -hmm. really reminded me that Sure, there might be a natural inclination to be more interested in the financial world, but I think we as financial advisors have a responsibility to make sure that in couples, both of them regularly and consistently turn up to meetings, postponing mm -hmm. or cancelling meetings or having separate meetings with the other person that wasn't able to turn up potentially unexpectedly on the day. Because even if the person says, I'm going to go back and relay it, or we've talked about it and I'm confident that this is the strategy, we're potentially not identifying a red flag there and or helping people learn more about financial literacy. And what we know in Australia is that, and Moo, take comfort, on average, <laughs> when you look at it through a gendered lens, men feel more competent about mm. managing the money. They feel more confident about managing the money, but actually... When you look at, um, and there was industry research done on this a few years ago, women pale in comparison when it comes to the confidence piece, but they are just as competent. And so we've got so much myth busting to do to say to mm. women who might say, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't really get it. And what they do is they create this self-fulfilling prophecy where they lean further and further out and then the men lean further and further in. And then we do end up with situations mm. where they do take more control. And that to me is just the canary in the coal mine that is helping perpetuate these problems. It's such a good call, Jess, because I think there's there's two parts to that, right? So there's the there's the piece around prevention, which is um, you know, kind of where it's at now, right? Um we have spent um, sort of 40, 50 years building really strong you know, um, women's crisis service responses. But actually what we've recognised here in Australia and, and in other countries is um, it's no good just doing that um, constant 
crisis piece all of the time. We have to put an equal importance um, and that's you know why I'm really privileged to have this role here at Wajek is on the prevention piece and so that's having conversations with your kids from the earliest ages um, that are all about framing gender equality for them because um, if you start breaking down those stereotypes from when they're you know and I can say this because I've got a, an 18 month old and a, and a five-year-old if you start having these conversations with them now um, then you are setting them up much better to have that level of confidence to be able to ask the right questions or connect to the right places to get the information which is what we've you know traditionally historically we've done that for boys always right um and that's what the, that's how the boys club kind of um manages to um perpetuate itself so there's the, the, there's the prevention piece there's also the piece around you know you have unique opportunities to have um to have conversations with with couples and sometimes that will be you know both people together and sometimes that will be um both people separately but um because financial abuse is something that is really not understood and it's not part of the um, kind of mainstream um, conversation around uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, gender-based violence. Um, there's also that kind of responsibility to go, um, where can we take that extra care? Where can we um, have those conversations in a different way that actually um, raise awareness for people who are potentially experiencing this and, and making sure that, um, you know, if somebody does disclose, which they may, um, they, you know, it may be that you, that you say something to them and it suddenly um, triggers, you know, a, a thought pattern or a, um, a, a series of um, kind of inner revelations around what's going on for them. And you may be the person that they reach out to. Um, you know, it may be that um, in the financial sense, that's the easiest way that they can understand what's going on in terms of that misuse of power and control. So just making sure that you're equipped to be able to point them in the right direction, because we don't need to make all of you um, domestic and family violence um, experts. You don't need to be specialists in this stuff. It's um, it's having a bit of empathy, it's having a bit of understanding, it's being able to use your professional skills to really guide people in the right direction to get that help where they need it. And that's what we do every day with a financial lens on and we can absolutely adapt that to make yep. sure that we can help them in another way as well. Mo, what if you suspect it? What if you suspect it but they haven't outwardly said anything? Mm. Um, it's a really tough one because you may be messing with somebody's safety fundamentally. So um, I, I think when it's a friend or a family member or a colleague, it's probably it's easier to make a judgment around those circumstances to say, look, I'm worried about you. Um, your behaviour's changed. You've stopped turning up to family events. Um, I'm concerned. Is everything OK? Uh, or, you know, I heard the way that my brother-in-law was speaking to you. That's not cool, um, you know, to have that kind of, uh, that more gentle conversation and recognize that they may or may not be ready to to um, uh, to talk to you and have you know that kind of intimate level of conversation with you um, if you see it in a workplace um, certainly workplaces I think have come a really long way in terms of um, starting to have quite strong um, responses and um, and support structures for victim survivors of violence so a number of workplaces now have um, paid domestic violence um, leave. Um, some have um, unlimited paid domestic violence leave. Some have um, leave that you can access um, to be able to support, you know, a, friend, a, a family member or somebody really close to you who's going through the process of extricating themselves from um, from domestic violence. So we're see we've seen, well, we are seeing a real shift in that space in terms of the role of business and industry to um, be able to support their workforces and um, and people within um, their workforces. If it's a customer or a client, I would say it's very dependent on the relationship that you have with them. Um, probably being aware that um, most banks now, most financial institutions have, you know, that extra care um, team or role somewhere within them. So um, recognising that um, that might be the most appropriate place to kind of point them in the direction of if it's look, looking, you know, purely financial. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, also being aware, of course, of 1-800-RESPECT, which is the National Sexual Assault and domestic and family violence um, counselling service. It's 24-7, um, it's confidential. Anybody can ring that. So if you, um, for example, were to sit down with a um, uh, one of your clients this afternoon and you think there's something going on and you're not quite sure how to approach it, I would say to you, Jess, 
pick up the phone, call 1-800-RESPECT, talk it through with them. They can kind of workshop it with you um, and work out what the safest way might be to intervene, um, depending on the circumstances, depending on your relationship with them. Um, because just naming it might be a dangerous thing to do. It may um, increase the risk for that person. Yeah, wow. It's, um, it's interesting because I have had a situation where I suspected something may not be 100% um, and – I called that person at a later time and said, are you safe? Are you okay? Do you need help? And I didn't quite know what to do thereafter because it mm. is, um, it's a it's a situation that we don't get taught really anything yeah. about and you have to do go and do your own um, research. So that that number again, just so that is it 1-800-RESPECT? It's 1-800-RESPECT, 1-800-737-732 um, and you can call that anytime from anywhere in Australia. It's um, – the National Sexual Assault and Domestic and Family Violence Counselling Service. So um, you can also pass that number on to clients if it's, um, you know, safe to do so. You could stick it on the bottom of your email header. Um, you know, there's a whole range of different places that, um, that that number is, you know, fairly widely known now. It sounds to me, Jess, as if you did absolutely the right thing. You know, a, a lot of the time, as I said, we're not um, trying to set you up to be expert responders in this space. That's not your job. Um, and a lot of this is about being human um, and having empathy and um, just assessing in the situation. You know, if, you, if you're concerned about somebody and you can have that conversation, you know, separate from the partner, obviously never, ever have the you know name that kind of stuff when um, both of them are in the in the room together in front of you, um, but yeah, and and sometimes you know the woman will say, yeah, actually, thank you, thank you for um, thank you for reaching out. Um, other times, you know, there may be complete denial, but it, knowing that um, uh, you have done everything you can in that set of circumstances, and actually that might be the trigger. That gets her to go away and think about it, and um, and reach out to a uh, you know a support service like one eight hundred respect or or elsewhere, or you know a bank or a financial institution as well. So um, yeah, there's a there's um, a range of ways that we can all sort of be part of this solution. Yeah, and it's been interesting because to get you to talk to me today, I've just been thinking about the lens of our clients or our members. But as you were talking. It's so obvious that we need to think about this as humans who live mm. in communities and employers. So one of the things that we did at Fox and Hair recently is we added, I mean, I'm sure, you know, and this is funny thing as an employer, like it was in my brain and just never formalized. So we formalized domestic leave in our employee handbook and we made our staff aware of what domestic leave is when you work at Fox and Hair. And I hope that no one ever needs to use it, but I also want them to know that I absolutely want them to use it if they need to. But that's a very mm. simple thing that we as often small business owners in Australia running financial advice businesses should take yeah. the effort to do, to formalize it, to document it, and actually to sit down with our staff members and explain what it is and what you yeah. should be using it and when you should be using it for. Yeah, and that's that's spot on. So it's, you know... Um, for many people, it will be a symbolic thing. So it'll be, you know, we are saying within this business and recognizing that for small businesses, this, um, you know, building in those sorts of things can be um, can be a challenge, but saying, actually, this is a priority for us, not because we think, you know, every staff member is going to need it on an annual basis, but um, it needs to be there for people um, that, you know, when they, when they need to take it. Um, and domestic violence leave, I think, is something that um, is... Um, growing in popularity all over the world now, you know, there's um, significant numbers of um, businesses of all types are, are starting to take this on. Of course, the piece that needs to sit around that is the awareness and the um, in larger businesses, for example, um, you know, in some of the banks is having making sure that you've got the right kind of structures and systems so that if a staff member does need to um, disclose anything to, you know, their line manager that they've got um, safety and confidentiality around that. The other piece I think that's really interesting that um, that business is starting to take on is also how do we how do we deal with perpetrators? How do we deal with people who are using violence um, in workplaces? Because you know, just as we recognise that um, you know one in four women is impacted by this in her adult lifetime, we know that significant numbers of um, of men are you know turning up to work every day, sometimes using workplace resources to actually further that abuse. Um, and often you'll see some of those sorts of behaviours um, that might um, 
might belie that they have those underlying attitudes about um, about women, um, about gender equality. Um, certainly some of the stuff we've seen in the sexual harassment place and um, Kate Jenkins' Respect at Work um, report a couple of years ago, I think it all kind of ties on it ties in and is part of the conversation that we're having now. And is that, excuse my ignorance, is that just noticing language, commentary, off the cuff comments, you know, behaving in a way that is disrespectful to people and and calling that out? Is that, is that quite yeah, simply yeah, what we're talking yeah. about? Yeah, absolutely. And recognizing that, um, you know, if you walk into a, um, into a meeting and there is, um, and it usually is a guy, <laughs> Let's face it, a, a man um, who continually talks over women, um, who um, uh, regurgitates her ideas and brands them as his own, um, who, you know, is constantly telling jokes that are a bit off, they're a bit sexist, racist, um, you know, those sorts of um, stereotyped uh, things, recognising that the people in that room who don't have the power are probably the least comfortable and the least equipped to be able to um, to call that out. So, uh, again, it comes back to that kind of bystander piece of, you know, how can those of us who are in the room and who have a bit more of a voice, how can we challenge that stuff and say, actually, that's not, you know, the behaviour that we want and do you realise that you just spoke over her? Um, you know, and most, I think most businesses and companies now have a reasonable set of structures and processes around, around that in, um, you know, internally. This topic, I could talk to you for so long about this because as you're talking, I'm thinking about sort of all of the, the differing intersecting components to this as financial advisors, as sometimes business owners, as employees or employers, as parents, children, friends, siblings, you know, mm. this does pervade every area of our life. And I, I really feel that whilst this is a complicated, challenging and difficult conversation, it cannot be something that we push to the side to deal with mm. later when we have time, effort, energy and resources because that just isn't acceptable. And, and it's so evident that the community and our expectations as members of the community have been shifting for a very long time, but the vocalization of that has definitely been louder and stronger, I think, in the last few years, particularly mm. younger women saying like, no more, and we're not putting up with this. And, you know, without wanting to be overly crass, like I think financial advisors have to recognize that even if your member base is old, wealthy white men, their children are going to inherit their money soon and they will yeah. not want to work with people that don't care about this stuff. And so the idea that this is someone else's problem, that I've got too many regulatory issues or, you know, mm. business considerations, it just can't happen. We have to hold space for thinking about what can we do? Not that we can be heroes and fix everything. And it's great to hear that there's some fantastic resources, but um, yeah, I just feel like the time is now to be having specifically financial abuse conversations. Cause as I said, I mm. felt like for the longest time, this hadn't been something that I had learnt very much about. And I do feel we're in a privileged position to educate Australians that financial abuse is a thing, that it is real, that it clearly impacts a lot of people. And I look forward to reading that Deloitte report and that we can potentially help people learn the red, um, the red flags as well. Mm. And, and to be part of that, um, that prevention piece of, you know, like let's shift it for the next generation because I firmly believe um, that in a generation's time, we now know, I mean, things like the Deloitte report that came out yesterday, we have such a sense of the, pre um, the prevalence and the impacts of this violence, right? So a generation ago, we didn't have all the information. We didn't know how bad it was, who was being impacted, what those impacts looked like over the um, course of a lifetime. Um, you know, we didn't know that the experiences of women were so much worse than men or it, when we did know it, we didn't, we just didn't talk about it. It was just accepted. We know now, we know what the, this is doing to, um, to children and young people who are growing up in, um, in violence in households. We know um, what the impacts will be if they don't get um, the right kind of support and, um, and responses on the other side of this. So I firmly believe that if, um, if we don't fix it now and if we don't, you know, uh, use the information that we have now and the breadth of knowledge that we have now about the size of the problem or what we need to do to fix it, then um, in a generation's time, they'll be coming back to us saying, you were negligent. You knew the size of the problem and you chose to do nothing about it because it was an uncomfortable thing to talk about or, you know, it was difficult to challenge because it was something that was going on in your immediate family.
Yeah, and I I understand why young women are so angry about this. I understand why older feminists are so angry about this because they've been banging their heads up against the patriarchy for, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years and they haven't seen enough change happen yet. Well, I'm delighted to have you to help us learn more about this uncomfortable but very real um, situation that is occurring. And I can't thank you enough for spending time teaching us and helping us identify it today. Can I change complete tact because today has been quite heavy? Um, But I I do want to say thank you because I know that um, your time is very precious and I'm delighted to have you. But I would love to round out today's conversations with a couple of rapid fire questions to you if that's okay go for it Jess yep okay I want to know so my podcast is all about how do we live great lives and so I think today's conversation is about how we can help our clients live great lives Um, but this is sort of more holistic so I want to know what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health I have a bath every single morning for I um start my day I was born in England I'm, you know and I'm very firmly English in my bathness it's the thing that keeps me sane so um, if I don't get my bath uh, it's not that my day falls apart but there is definitely something missing that is the most exciting thing I have ever heard <laughs> as someone who is an aspirational bather and I get like one that one a week every morning just seems every so morning and amazing every morning <gasps> congrats to you I mean uh, don't get me wrong it's not a long bath I have two small kids so um, it's often like a kind of two minute soak but it's it's my time it totally (laughs) counts uh what would you say to younger moo what's one piece of advice you would give younger moo oh gosh um enjoy all the travel enjoy all of the moments even the ones that feel really dark and intense and you're not sure where you're going next um it definitely takes you on the journey to where you are right now love that one thing that is yet to be ticked off your bucket list oh well it's not yet to be ticked off, but I want to go back and live in Europe again sometime soon. I miss Spain very much. So maybe living on a Spanish island. There you go. Oh, that would be amazing. I have a fake book club, which is just books that I read, and then I give my opinions to the world. Mm. Do you have a book for me to add to my fake book club? Oh, I do. If you have not read um, Chelsea Watergo's Another Day in the Colony, get it and read it. I very, mm. very rarely get to read these days. I, um, I did a degree in it, literature and language, English, way back in my um, late teens, early 20s. And so I used to read, we used to have to read about 14 or 15 books a week for university. Um, now that I have two small kids, I have no time for reading. But um, this is the first book that I actually got to sit and I was just, I read it like voraciously over a couple of days. It's confronting, it's um, powerful, it's challenging, and it's um, it really explains how... Um, young Aboriginal feminists um, in Australia today uh, fit within the whole, um, you know, the, the society that we're living in here, but Black Lives Matter. It's just, it's wonderful. Chelsea Watergo, Dr. Chelsea Watergo. Um, right now, adding to the list. Thank you very, very much. Uh, that is all. Moo, huge thank you again for your time today. Very, very much appreciated. And uh, we want, I will add the um, information about the new podcast and the Deloitte research into the show notes as well. So a huge thank you. Thank you. It was really lovely having a chat, Jess. Happy to come back anytime. <gasps> thank you. We might take you up on that. Thanks, Moo. No worries. Take care.